Okay, uh, good evening everybody to tonight's Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee on the 18th of October. Uh, just like to remind everybody that this uh, meeting is being recorded and will be available on YouTube. Uh, I'd just like to welcome uh, new members, uh, councillors Jones and Smith. Uh, and just like to thank uh, members that are gonna, uh, have left the committee this evening, which are councillors Cook and councillor Jay as a borough, borough representative, but he is still the county uh, representative to sit on this committee. Uh, apologies I've had from the chair, Councillor Claymore, Councillor Greatrex, who's on uh, mayoral duties, and uh, Councillor Kingston. Uh, that's it, isn't it? Do we know of anybody else? No. Okay. Uh, Item number two, uh, the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 12th of July are here for approval. Can I request a mover and seconder, please? Was anybody here? Yeah. Uh, seconder? Can somebody else can we second it? Okay, we'll just defer them minutes till the next meeting. Uh, because there seems to be a change around uh, for this tonight's meeting. Uh, item number three, are there any declarations of interest? Uh, item number four, uh, update from the chair. Uh, sadly, uh, with the passing of uh, Her Majesty the Queen, last, month, uh, last month's meeting was cancelled, uh, and as a result, uh, Midlands Partnership Foundation Trust have come here tonight uh, in early early August, uh, the ICB, which for those that don't know is the Integrated Care Board, updated on finding a long-term solution for the inpatient mental health services previously provided at the George Bryan Centre. Uh, there's been numerous circulations of different reports. Uh, if any of the new members haven't had sight of these, uh, please let me know after and I can pass them on. Uh, the... The review of the services have been halted by the ICB and Midlands Partnership Foundation Trust at the NHS England stage, uh, which could allow both of them to reflect on their business proposal. There's nothing else from me. Uh, item number five. Update from the Midlands Partnership Foundation Trust. Uh, we've got the Assistant Director for Partnerships, Joe Sands here, and Up Jetta, uh, who is the Midlands Partnership Foundation Trust Head of Primary Care Development. And uh, we've got the Mental Health Programme Lead, uh, sorry, who is the Mental Health Programme Lead, and Suzanne Unwin, who is a consultant nurse and approved clinician at the uh, Trust. And uh, I'd like to hand over to both of them, please. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and it has been a while since we've been back at this group and uh, really nice to meet the, all the new members as well. What we've done is pulled together just um, a short presentation, just highlighting the development since we last kind of spoke to this committee, plus an overview of um, mental health provision. So next slide, please. Um, so what we'll do first is for those members who are not familiar with the configuration of our mental health provision. <coughs> so next slide, Joe. Um, Sue's just going to kind of describe how our mental health provision is currently configured. Hi, hi everybody. Um, yeah, so if you, I don't know if you can read the slides that are up there. So, huh? oh, they've got copies. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So, um, first of all, if you go through the adult mental health community, it says adult community mental health teams are now called integrated community mental health teams. Um, and one of the reasons that is, is that we're integrated with lots of other voluntary sectors as well, that are all now contributing to the whole, as you will see as the presentation goes on, to make it a, a more cohesive more holistic service okay we've also got um the iap service that looks at psychological interventions for people that haven't got severe and enduring mental illness that have got more anxiety depression trauma work is also undertaken there so that's quite a useful a really useful service actually 
There's, we've got um, a memory service in Dudley. We've got the dementia and memory service across Staffordshire, South Staffordshire. We've got Core 24. So for those that aren't aware what Core 24 is, it's um, an initiative which allow, which puts in liaison psychiatry into A&Es that run 24 hours a day, and that's running in Burton. That's 24 hours a day. So if someone goes in and they suspect there's some mental health needs, there is people that they can call on straight away to go and assess that and, and put some interventions in. Okay, um, as well as that, we've got adult um, liaison psychiatry. That's in Stafford Hospital, a county hospital, um, for the hours that the A&E is in working. Uh, mental health crisis team, um, and we've got a, a dementia liaison team, an access team. Now, the access team is where anybody that's got any mental health needs that wants to refer themselves in, or you feel that someone needs to be referred in, or the GPs, we refer into access and they undertake the assessment and then signpost that person to whatever services they think that person needs, or if it's something brief, they can they can help them to sort of resolve whatever issues without needing to come into the full service. And then we've also got specialist mental health support into prisons and joint working with um, the local authorities, okay? And then at St George's um, Hospital in Stafford, we've got numerous inpatient facilities. We've got the adult mental health wards. We've got three of those. We've got older adult wards. We've also got a dementia ward. We've got MOD beds. We've got a PQ bed, which is a psychiatric intensive care unit for people that are very in need of more intensive support, and also the 136 suite. So for those that aren't aware, if somebody's picked up by the police in the community and it's felt that they are suffering from a mental health need and that needs to be assessed, they can take them to the 136 suite and they'll be assessed by doctors and nurses on the St George's site and then provision will be made from there. But as well as the wards, the social care element that wraps around that, that is put in, we've got um, a hospital discharge team, and that's, I can't praise this enough because I've just had recent dealings with them, and they're amazing. At, so if someone comes into hospital, we've just had a lady come into hospital, it was become very apparent that she didn't have a lot of facilities at home. They've sorted all that out. They've got her a fridge, they've got her a washing machine, had it all plumbed in so that she can deal with that. And they're also looking at getting her some neck curtains because she's quite exposed. So you know, so they do alert. They do lots of things to help discharge go smoothly and to help people on their discharge. That's it's a really really good service. We've got um, the mental health. So, um, the Section 75 Act was in agreement with social services where um, social workers are part of the mental health teams, if you like. So they're working within health so that they're, they're more, they've got more contact with us. So it's a more smooth transition of care. And we've also got um, the community managed libraries, which is another facility that's run by the Trust. Joe, do you want to go to the next slide? So that's just an overview of our current provision. So I'm going to give you an update on the community mental health framework and the developments um, with the framework itself. So if we go to the next slide, again, quite a complex picture in terms of what the model, the emerging model is looking like. So what we've tried to do with the model is close the gaps between provision. So particularly between primary care and secondary care services, we have uh, mental health well-being, uh, so we have mental health practitioners um, that operate from primary care. We've also got our IAP service, which is a primary care service, but we've recruited what we call complex trauma workers, which bridge the gap between primary and secondary care services. And then as, um, um, as complexity increases, that's where you've got your more of your specialist pathway. So it's part of the transformation we're developing our personality disorder pathway. Um, we've got a rehab pathway, which is predominantly run and delivered in partnership with our voluntary sector partners and um, eating disorders. So there's a requirement through the transformation that we uh, enhance our eating disorder pathway. Um, and what we're trying to do now is implement the waiting time standard. So there's a requirement that actually from referral to first appointment uh, doesn't exceed four weeks and that's what we're putting in metrics to ensure that we are achieving those time scales and where possible bringing some interventions kind of forward. What we have done is produced a video which 
kind of brings to life the transformation. And I'm just wondering, Joe, if you could play the video. The Community Mental Health Transformation Programme forms part of a national programme set out in the NHS long-term plan to enable adults with severe mental illness to access care and support in a new, more joyful and effective way, regardless of their diagnosis or level of complexity. This is about offering flexible and personalised care and support that responds to an individual's mental health needs and preferences close to home, while also encompassing support for the wider factors that can impact wellbeing. Health and care providers are working more collaboratively with local authorities and voluntary and community organisations to support and address the wider determinants that impact on mental health. So, why are we doing this? Population health management has been a huge part of the transformation programme. So far, we have looked at patient data and discovered the priority groups and communities that are at high risk of serious mental illness. This process has enabled us to establish a clear set of priorities which will address unwanted variation in access to care and improve holistic support at the patient and the community level. These priorities are financial wellbeing, housing, lifestyle, future focus and covert further use. System partners, service users and their carers are at the heart of the transformation. Co-production will help develop services that combine lived experience with traditional clinical skills. This will facilitate a more person-centred service that is focused on the user's needs based on user experience of one important to care and their general well-being. Flexible and will help people to make the best use of 
that you need two resources. The future focus pathway will work with individuals who have severe and enduring mental health needs. Some individuals are likely to require regular support to enable them to build a trusted relationship with their main support worker to end their mental health needs. This will involve working together to develop smart goals from areas including things like well-being and employment, spirituality and sleep patterns. Progress will be reviewed regularly to enable development of new goals if required and to reflect on achieved outcomes. Individuals who may have additional complexities will require a more intensive and at times a longer support to aid their recovery. Delivering our lifestyle services across society is an everyone's help. Studies have shown that service users with serious mental illness have huge disparities in health outcomes and life expectancy. A key factor of this is underactivity and being overweight, which contributes to a much higher prevalence of long term health conditions. The lifestyle service will have a focus on increasing physical activity levels among service users. There will also be guidance on weight management, healthy eating, and education. It will not be a traditional weight loss programme, but will primarily support service users to eat healthily, be more active, and enable them to have better well-being and have a positive impact on their mental health. Delivering the co-occurring needs service will be humankind. ICON is the integrated co-occurring needs pathway. Its ultimate aim is to ensure that adults with mental health and substance use needs across South Staffordshire are supported to achieve their goals for recovery. And the Bonner Crow team is taking close and exercise with primary and secondary care services in South Staffordshire. I call it a peer to former and four minor care, which focuses on engagement, choice and strength. It promotes integrated working, offers consultation and coordinates shared training opportunities for those working ICON is confident that by working together towards shared goals, individuals with co-occurring substance use and mental health needs can achieve change and find a better balance in their life. Many voluntary community and social enterprise organisations across Staffordshire provide invaluable mental health and wellbeing support and have a wealth of experience, knowledge and community insight. The current focus on community mental health transformation should include the whole of the voluntary community and social enterprise mental health sector. This is a brand new way of working where voluntary services will be integrated into mental health teams. Our partners will have access to our clinical systems for notes along with access to diaries so that we work together as a single entity to ensure the service is seamless from a service user perspective. We know that this is a big change for our teams. Research has proven that this will help to improve outcomes for the communities that we serve. With all of your help, we can really transform the lives of service users and those who care for them in our community. We've worked with NPFT to identify key trends, challenges and priorities for our communities and to set about getting them on the community mental health transformation. By working in partnership with local BCFD partners, MPFT can provide a coordinated approach to care which will make a real difference to our Staffordshire population. Ensure with health and care decision makers, peers and views for communities which experience the greatest health inequalities. This will make it easier for all communities to access services and will reduce health inequalities. Bringing the expertise of the BCFD sector and the community based work group will help to free up clinical capacity. We hope you have enjoyed our introduction to our new adult services. This is an exciting time for community mental health services, a journey that will make a true difference to service users and the Staffordshire population. Brilliant, thank you, Joe. If you want to move on to the next slide, so that was just a snapshot of what we've been doing with the transformation. So I'm just going to talk about some of the other developments. So um, first one is um, crisis alternatives. So uh, a key ambition in the long term plan. If you move on to the next slide 
is an alternatives um, to inpatient facilities and emergency provision. And again, there's a requirement for us to work hand in glove with voluntary sector providers. So recently we've um, we, we heard the outcome of a capital submission to NHS EI um, to fund a crisis cafe, which we're calling Safe Haven, which will be located in the Tamworth Borough. Working in conjunction with the crisis cafe will be a provision called Safe Hands, so that essentially providing a crisis response through voluntary sector providers, but in somebody's home where there's no capacity in the actual crisis cafe, or it's more appropriate to um, support those individuals in their own home. Move on to the next slide. So we currently have a crisis house in, um, it's called Brendan House. It's based in um, Cannock. And we are exploring opportunities of whether we, we relocate that provision into the Tamworth area as well. Move on to the next slide, which is Core 24. I won't go into this in too much detail because Sue kind of mentioned this provision already. So the uh, Core 24, like Sue said, is um, co-located, if we move on to the next slide, with accident and emergency services. So Burton Hospital, um, we have mental health practitioners from a range of disciplines. So what we've done is looked at um, what the local need is and we've made sure that the composition of the team is reflected of the need. So we have sub-specialisms of substance misuse, learning difficulties. We have an older adult specialist as well. If we move on to the next slide. So in terms of development um, that are happening around Core 24, so we've now uh, recruited in line with the national requirements and the principles of Core 24. And we've actually expanded the accommodation footprint from Burton Hospital. In terms of next steps, we're enhancing that provision to look at the, um, the development of a self-harm pathway, because that's what the data is kind of suggesting that we need to focus on. And suicide prevention is another area of focus for us. Uh, next slide. Um, Sue mentioned this as well, so the winter discharge and the hospital avoidance. Um, it's called the discharge pathway um, and essentially what the discharge pathway does is support with the holistic needs that enable somebody who's had an inpatient stay to be discharged. So um, what, what happens is a co-produced care plan is developed before they leave hospital. They have a recovery worker working with them for up to four weeks. But the rest of the plan is tailored to that individual's needs. And I think Sue gave some examples of how that's been utilised. If we move on to the next screen, which is just some examples of some of the um, some of the interventions that Pathway is able to offer. So it kind of ranges from um, communication devices, uh, restoring utility bills, deep cleaning, carrying out emergency repairs, paying for appliances, um, also kind of supporting with food on discharge as well. Okay, and if we move on to the next one, which is the hospital avoidance scheme. So in, in the same way, the discharge pathway supports individuals um, as they're discharged, the hospital avoidance pathway is to kind of try and prevent an admission to hospital out of hours. So it's an emergency response in terms of accommodation, food and utility bills. And that gives us the opportunity to, to do a proper assessment with the individual during core working hours to assess what the true needs are. Just to give you, uh, if we move on to the next, yeah, so if we just give you an overview. So last year, I mean, we, we were just funded to run this over the winter period, but because it's been so successful, we've decided to continue the funding of this pathway. And it's delivered, again, in partnership with voluntary sector organisations. So um, last year, we, um, that pathway saw 145 patients were supported, um, over 70,000 contacts. Um, what we're now focusing on is enhancing that pathway this year. So we've enhanced it with a financial wellbeing advisor. We're supplementing that with a housing officer um, who started recently as well. And we're now looking at how do we kind of address some of the other issues that have started to kind of present or impact on readmissions like homelessness. Um, 
IAP services. So um, again, Sue kind of gave an overview of IAP services. So if we move on to the next slide. So IAP is about increasing psychological interventions. Um, anybody can refer themselves, so you don't need to go through your GP. You can contact um, the IAP service directly, but you can also um, book an appointment through the website now. Again, this service is delivered in partnership with a range of voluntary sector providers. But there's also a non-IAP element to IAP as well now. So where somebody doesn't meet caseness for IAP services, um, we, we have a range of voluntary sector providers that will be able to kind of support them. The service has been enhanced, so we've also got an integrated um, bereavement service as well. So if we move on to the next slide of that, and, and again, that's just the contact details and how to refer. Um, and in terms of IAPT, how they're performing, so IAPT has got some very challenging targets um, and there's been marked improvements um, and it significantly grows next year to cope with a higher prevalence, um, which all IAPT teams are expected to kind of focus on. Um, we've also kind of produced or been part of a national media campaign to increase awareness of the provision. And what we've started to do is focus on how do we um, engage with underrepresented groups. So we know that the older adults in particular are not engaging with this provision. So we're looking at technology to kind of help support with this. Um, and I've also kind of mentioned um, the complex trauma workers that sit between IAP services and secondary care services. So, final slide, and then I'll hand over the question. So other developments. So um, we're looking at how we undertake ADHD prescribing and we're working with um, external um, pharmacists to kind of help with that, which frees up clinical capacity. Um, we're just about to mobilise another provision called short-term homestay, which focuses on supporting older adults and dementia patients that have been admitted to hospital. Um, and the final kind of initiative is um, assertive outreach for people with SMI who um, have failed to kind of attend their physical health checks. And we know the importance of having physical health checks. So what we've now commissioned is an assertive outreach programme to kind of help that with that engagement and that uptake of the physical health checks, but also kind of vaccinations, because it's those individuals that are most at risk. And that's the end of my uh, presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Cheers. Just like to thank you both. Uh, before we go on to questions, uh, if we just try and narrow them down, we'll keep them tied into community and not veer off onto the George Bryant Centre or Stafford because uh, the county are dealing with that uh, and uh, the two presenters here are just here specifically for community. Cheers. Uh, thanks a lot, Jad. Thank you. Uh, I've actually got five questions, so if you want me to go through them one by one or do you want me to do one and see if anyone else has got any? You, you tell me. I'll do one first. <clears throat> so firstly, it all looks... Fantastic. I think anything that integrates services for users, doesn't have the barrier of going through the GP, etc., can only be a good thing. So it all sounds fantastic. Um, first question, and it's it's something that's impacting every bit of every service in the country is workforce. So what are your plans for workforce and is that going to impact the delivery of this? Because you simply don't won't have the people to be able to deliver all the good stuff we've talked through. Um. Actually, workforce is no longer an issue for us because what we did was took the decision of about six months ago to look at a contemporary workforce and look at how services could be delivered in a slightly different way. So we're, um, we, you've seen all of the voluntary sector providers that we're working in partnership with. So, okay, sorry. so what we've done is... Um, um, the, the transformation requires us to work with voluntary sector and nationally we're only required to ring fence 20% of that investment to the voluntary sector. 
MPFT have taken the decision to um, significantly increase the proportion of activity that's delivered by voluntary sector. And um, our total contract values to the voluntary sector is in excess of £2.5 million. So it's a significant investment. What that's enabled us to do is bring our vacancy rate down from 27% to 13%. And we are continually looking at new contemporary workforce to help deliver the requirements of the transformation. So there's a, a requirement to increase psychological interventions. So we're working really closely with Keele University to look at clinical associate psychologists. Um, so that's how we're addressing some of the, the issues around um, national uh, shortage of um, certain occupations. Okay, thank you. Can I go to another question or should we move on? One more and then move on. Cool. Um, you mentioned a four, if I heard it correctly, a four week SLA for someone to be referred to the service. So the national standard, waiting time standard, is four weeks from when the person is referred to when they start um, interventions with us. So that's what we're working to. And we've got until the end of this financial year to put the metrics in place that enable us to monitor achievements against that standard okay so my question is so, so that's not the first but so that's that's a national standard is an aspiration to be better than that because four weeks and it's a national thing but four weeks from when someone's had a mental health issue to be referred sounds like a very very long time that's the maximum time okay. so it is our aspiration to do better than that until we've got the metrics in place we don't know where we are against yeah. that metric and obviously it would be our ambition to kind of ensure that interventions are delivered as quickly as possible. Now, what we what we do do is, so in terms of our mental health practitioners that sit in primary care, so they actually start some of those interventions at that first appointment. So we're using um, loads of technology. So we've got self-help tools that we're able to give to individuals to kind of help them um, start their recovery journey. The other thing we've done is um, we start some of the holistic needs, addressing the holistic needs. So it may take a while for the for a, a clinical intervention to start, but that's why we've front loaded our access functions with housing officers, financial wellbeing. We've got um, substance and issue specialists who are able to kind of support with other aspects of that individual's care. Mm -hmm. So by the time they're seen by a clinician, actually their experience. Um, um, or the duration of clinical interventions is reduced. Okay, thank you. Uh, just for a, a bring in Councillor Smith, just to expand that. So that's four weeks till intervention, not assessment. Uh, uh, so um, the the four weeks uh, standard means that you you've got to have um, an assessment. Uh, um, 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 a trusted assessment, so what we're calling a trusted assessment, and the reason why we're calling it a trusted assessment is actually the feedback from service users was every time they spoke to somebody different, we're being reassessed. So the concept of a trusted assessment is that if somebody's carried out a trusted assessment, you shouldn't need to kind of ask those same questions again. What you do is build on that assessment. So completion of a um, trusted assessment, a baseline um, a quality measure is carried out so we have to initiate um, proms so patient recorded outcome measures um, and then you have to start some sort of an intervention in order to stop the clock so yeah, Smith. so um, on the slide on page 24 it talks about progress um, so it talks about performance as seen improvement and positive feedback. I was just wondering how that was measured, how, how that was compiled. So um, I have to have some very stringent um, performance metrics and I'm more than happy to kind of share them with you. So there's some targets around individuals accessing um, um, IAP services and that's based on prevalence targets. So what we expect the need in the community to be and once you've got your access targets and so the number of people accessing IAP, you've also got targets around recovery and how many people complete um, um, the actual IAP programme itself. Um, and there's some significant improvements in the targets. And remember, it's a county-wide provision, so we're counted in its totality. So if one area is overperforming, it's, it's, it's the overall performance of the contract. 
and we're more than happy to kind of share some of our um, recent successes. Okay. Uh, Councillor Joy. Thank you. Um, I've said I've got some more. There's two I can join together here. So you mentioned the safe haven, is that right? And you considering bringing that into Tamworth. And you also mentioned the crisis house, which is somewhere else I'm considering moving into Tamworth. Uh, have you assessed the need for it in Tamworth? And if there isn't that much of a need, are we importing it from somewhere else? If you move from somewhere else into Tamworth? So a safe haven is, um, we don't have a crisis cafe in um, South Staffordshire. So to ensure equity of access, um, our business case was approved uh, by NHS EI. Um, and we've put in a business case over, um, it's been several years since we've submitted it and we're constantly resubmitting the same business case. It, recently, it's been approved um, and that, capital program will take place in Tamworth because that's where the need is. Um, it will be working really closely with our crisis team. Um, what we're then looking at is what other services are complementary to the crisis cafe like the safe hands and the crisis house um, that could be brought together because actually working together you get a really enhanced provision. Can I come back in? Yeah. So obviously, services in Tamworth we're always going to welcome, right? But the, the particular one was the crisis house, which is coming from elsewhere. Um, it's currently located in Cannock, and we are exploring opportunities. So it doesn't mean it will definitely happen. We need to do a needs assessment before we consider where it's going to be located in the future. So does where, where it's located at the moment, is there anything that comes, any secondary issues that come from having it there like within you know no, because Brendan House is a provision for the whole of South Staffordshire so wherever these provisions are located they're accessible to the entire population okay thanks cheers I uh, just got a couple which might spur off another, another few questions uh, you spoke about um, practitioners in the primary care uh, network. Um, I was just wondering how many practitioners have you got working in the GPs in Tamworth? In Tamworth, um, so <laughs> this is quite interesting, so it's, it's up to the primary care network to agree to having a mental health practitioner. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Mercy and PCN have opted out of it. However, we've supplemented that provision with alternatives to try and address some of the inequalities. Now, we are looking at how do we address that health inequality and how we encourage the primary care network to um, take up a mental health practitioner. Because where we've seen it working really effectively, um, it's, reduced, it's reduced demand into secondary care services, increased access to IAP provision, but it's increasing, it's decreasing the time from assessment into intervention. So, um, East Staffordshire recently signed up and we'll be having four mental health practitioners working from that PCM, but Mercian at this stage have decided not to kind of pursue that. I don't really want you to speak for them, but have they given you any reasons for that? They've decided that they don't want to invest in it. Um, now, the, the roles are um, slightly different from the other additional reimbursable roles where 50% of the salary is funded by the mental health provider. So in this scenario, it would be MPFT. So we've offered the funding and it is available. We're in continued talks with them. Councillor uh, Yeah, are those different providers that are involved in this, are they going to have sort of like, for want of a better word, a disability passport so they don't have to explain to every provider every time they go, you know, will, it, will the systems talk to each other? Because there's nothing worse than somebody having to repeat it over and over again. So you would have seen from the video what we've done with all of the commissioned providers we've provided MPFT laptops, so they have access to our clinical system, so they have access to our diary system and they're able to put the notes on, and that's precisely the reason why we've done that, 
to prevent that repeat conversation taking place. We're enhancing that even further because there's a national requirement that patients should have access to their own records. So we're looking at what does that mean for somebody um, accessing mental health services? How do we ensure that they have their own care plan and they understand who's responsible for different aspects of their care? Just in addition to that, is there accessibility for, say, deaf, blind, you know, because I noticed on the video it was very good, but if somebody's got a, you know, um, a disability again, would that, you know, is, is the, is in different, on, on the website it's got accessibility formats, but does it go out to the wider? Um, yes, so we, we, we are able to translate any of our material. What we have done is, at the start of the transformation, we did a, quite a detailed population health analysis and we produced data packs which we consulted system partners service users the voluntary sector on and um, recall joe was at that meeting where we agreed the priorities and that's what's determined what we've gone out and kind of commissioned in addition to that that's helped us to understand um who are the underrepresented groups by area um, and what I forgot to mention on video was around the community grant um, so we've partnered with Community Foundation. So those organisations that were unsuccessful at um, securing um, um, a contract with us, there's other opportunities for funding through the transformation. So we set aside for the whole of Staffordshire and Stoke-on-Trent about a million pounds, which has gone into Community Foundation, which enables hyper-local organisations to bid for that money, depending on the criteria and the area of focus. So we've just awarded a number of contractors um, um, some funding to help um, improve access for people from underrepresented groups. Mm -hmm. uh, just got a few more. Um, with the winter discharge, I, th I think I asked this question before. I just want to double check because it, it yeah. doesn't say in in, in the uh, presentation. When you're looking at discharge, will there be somebody going to the property prior to discharge? So what happens is um, before the service users discharge from hospital, we co-produce a care plan. So if they need us to go into the property and they're giving us permission to do so, yes, we have done. Sometimes it's not always possible to do that, but what we have to do, and it's a requirement, is that we have to visit that service user in the property within 48 hours. Now, we brought that standard forward and we do it within 24 hours. The recovery worker will go to that patient's home and visit them and they will assess any additional needs that weren't identified on discharge. Um, spoke about uh, ICOM and the addiction uh, mental health uh, pathway. I uh, was just wondering if you'd heard of Better Way, uh, the charity, and uh, as an addiction charity from Litchfield, who have recently come into Tamworth uh, and are you working closely with them? So we're working um, with Humankind because they're the uh, County Council commissioned provision. Um, and what we've done with the transformation is encouraged um, partners, if they're able to, to kind of match fund some of the investment and what Staffordshire County Council have done with the co-occurring needs pathway is co-funded some of the additional roles that have gone into that kind of provision. Now, if there's opportunities for other organisations, we'll consider them as part of the Community Foundation grant scheme. I suppose, building on that, um, have you got representation on the Tamworth Mental Health Network at all? So, so basically, uh, there's a group of charities within Tamworth uh, that have all come together that have got a mental health focus. It's focus. Yeah. And I, was just I mean, we're familiar with um, a vast majority of those charities, and some of them are already partners. So, the short term homestay, uh, we've just awarded that to Communities Together CIC. They're also a consortium provider um, delivering the future focus pathway. Uh, last one from me. Um, mental health crisis teams. Is there anything specific for older people or people with dementia at the minute? So um, nationally, um, 
crisis resolution isn't commissioned for people with dementia. However, we do have a hospital avoidance team that provides support to people with dementia out of hours. And if appropriate, they'll go and visit them in the same way our crisis team do. Our crisis team um, is uh, an all age provision. So, um, so all age adult provision um, and does cover older adults. But we know we need to enhance the provision specific skills um, for older adults within that team. Sorry, that was meant to be the last one, but one just jumped straight into yeah. my head. Uh, unless anybody else has got any before I say that last one. Uh, this isn't a question about George Bryan, but that's a building that isn't being used. Could that not be used for community? mental health so we are looking at our um the provision of community provision within the tamworth area so um cherry orchard we've taken the decision to bring that back online um and we will start to be operating our community provision from there um the timeline for that's march of, of of this financial year for the first phase uh, we're also doing an extension on that property, which will enable us to increase activity, and that's uh, forecast to kind of be completed by September 2023. So that doesn't mean we've made any decisions regarding the George Bryan Centre. It just means that we've got a strong community um, um, presence within the area. What we wanted to do was choose a location that's accessible so Cherry Orchard will come online and that isn't dependent on the extension? Um, that isn't dependent on the extension. So we'll have services running from there from March 2023. And then we'll further, um, we'll further extend that uh, building to um, increase activity. Councillor Jeff. Thank you. Sorry if it's mentioned already, but I just want to check. Um, obviously in the press recently there's been a lot about teens and, and self-harm and stuff like that is do these services cover teens as well they don't this is adult services but our trust is um transforming um our um young adults and children's services and we're working quite closely with our cams provision because through the transformation there is a requirement to have a bespoke specific young adults pathway that focuses on kind of transitions or graduation into adult services. Okay, so if we get a situation which you know could happen, if you end up having a safe haven or something in Tamworth or um, these kind of places in Tamworth, people aren't necessarily going to know. Oh, that's not for teens, or they're, they're going to end up going there. So you're going to you're going to have some kind of pathway for people that do just turn up. Yeah, I mean it. it um, I mean, I'm going to have to come back to you on that, but. I mean, we wouldn't turn anybody away. We would look to how do we kind of make that safe for that individual to access that provision. Um, what we don't do at the moment is have our adult services and our children's services delivered in the same building. Um, if they are, they have to have kind of separate entrances. Dennis, if you want to kind of add to that. I think the only thing I can say is that if somebody turned up at sort of safe haven or wherever, then all the staff would try and do is to redirect them and try and find them the right and appropriate help for them. So, you know, make the referrals or contact people so that they would know where to go because it wouldn't be adapted for someone of, you know, a young person, really, because there's lots of different needs. needs. Yeah, but I think Thing you've mentioned there you wouldn't turn someone away even though it's not set up for that because that was the fear just that people go there because they've, they've heard of it and then because they're not in that age group they get just sent away and they feel worse you know they've gone there for a reason but if you, you've already answered that you wouldn't send them away you'd try and get them directed somewhere so yeah it'd be no different to if the, a young person presented to an adult community venue um you know our staff would redirect them to the most appropriate uh, place for them and we, like I said, we are enhancing our children's services. So there is a specific kind of crisis response now for children and young adults. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Woodrop. 
you know, just the last one from me, sorry. Um, obviously, we've got, at the moment, the cost of living crisis. Is the, is the organisation geared up for that? Because there's been, you know, obviously on the media and you read about it every, and see it every day. It, this is going to obviously impact and increase on your services in a big way, not only for people, you know, presenting themselves, but on the day-to-day -day living and how are they going to cope with that. You don't need to answer it in full, I'm just, just wondering if you've got no, a strategy no. in place for that. We do have a strategy, so part of our winter plan this year is to work with the borough councils to establish warm places, So, and what MPFT have committed to is an investment to each borough council area to enable support for the most vulnerable over the winter period. So. Um, got a conversation with Joe um, in the next couple of days so I'm sure Joe will bring that back to this group in terms of what we've agreed and how it will operate. Councillor Smith. Uh, hospital avoidance um, talks about the food £20 a day and utility bills. How is that provided? So it's um, a range of mechanisms. So we've got um, We've, on, on our hospital site, we've actually got um, um, a restaurant. So depending on when the individual is going to be discharged, it, we might place an order with them and um, the individual is given food to take home with them. Um, all of our um, discharge pathway staff have access to a payment card so they can address the immediate problem. So they can book things like emergency hotels, hostels, clear utility bills if required and then we've got a range of contractors that work with our voluntary sector providers mm. any more all right i'd just like to thank you both um so there was uh, no report to be considered uh, so no recommendation from that uh, did the committee have any recommendations at this point before i, I, I say thank you to the presenters Brilliant. thank you for your time okay. Cheers, thank you both. Cheers, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so item number six is the safeguarding children and adults at risk of abuse report. Uh, the report of the portfolio holder for voluntary sector, town centre, evening economy and community safety, Councillor Martin Summers. Uh, we've got uh, Councillor Summers in attendance and also uh, Joe Sands, the assistant director for partnerships. Uh, just like to hand over to Councillor Summers and Joe Sands, please. This report is the uh, well, I think we do it bi biannually now um, uh, around the uh, safeguarding uh, of the council. Um, so the recommendation is that uh, our members review the report, and obviously you can raise any questions with myself uh, in, in collaboration with Councillor Summers. Um, we have a legal responsibility to, to safeguard children and adults at risk um, and it's integrated into the day-to-day -day operations of the council. Uh, we, we do respond to all safeguarding risk, um, concerns, um, usually via, um, well, mostly via our uh, colleagues at Staffordshire, the first response for adults and the child, line, uh, child crisis line. Uh, and then we ask staff to actually confirm the actions they've taken around that safeguarding and that's then followed up by uh, the, vulnerability, the Partnership Vulnerability Officer. Um, you'll see from the statistics that we've had um, from quarter two, we, the staff have referred 10 child, children into the service and 19 adult referrals. Um, miscellaneous referrals cover those that come through council inquiries. Um, so the quarterly review um, of the safeguard referrals is attached uh, the appendix on the report that members have. Um, all staff are required to do the level one safeguarding training um, and also as, as, as councillors you will have also had that level one safeguarding training when you, once you've become a councillor 
and also it's expected to be refreshed every three years. The level two safeguarding um, is developed by Staffordshire Safeguarding Children's Board and the, all staff roles within the council have now actually been identified to ensure that the appropriate staff have the level two safeguarding. There is also a level three and again staff are identified dependent on roles um, and the partnership vulnerability office has been working with managers to constantly review that. The level four specialist training um, as a designated safeguarding lead um, is operational responsibility. Uh, that is me as a safeguarding lead and I need to update that every two years. You'll note from there also there is a requirement for taxi driver safeguarding training. It's a, a responsibility around their licence and the partnership vulnerability officer takes um, on that training duty. It's been delivered largely through Microsoft Teams, uh, but we've also now been able to reinstate the face-to-face -face training um, with taxi drivers who are getting about to get their licence and that training is run once a month. We have uh, suicide prevention training available to all staff um, and that supports our suicide policy and processes so that staff are actually able to try and assist and inform members of the public who may be uh, at a crisis point. Um, dates are, are available and there is more dates to be released. We're still active members of the Adult Safeguarding Board um, the last one there is the modern slavery, which refers to offences of human trafficking, slavery, servitude, and forced or compulsory labour. Um, we are required by law, the uh, Modern Slavery Act 2015, to have a modern slavery statement that will be um, endorsed by, hopefully endorsed by order and governance next week, and will be signed off by cabinet. That just aligns and actually updates our approach to modern slavery within our supply chains and anybody that's then identified through any safeguarding. The contextual safeguarding, contextual safeguarding is safeguarding outside of, of home or um, institutions, as, whether that be schools. Um, the multi-agency children child exploitation panel is continuing and we still have members, member staff that goes to that partnership vulnerability officer and also assist with our community safety agenda. Safeguarding also covers prevent. Prevent is the um, counter-terrorism strategy uh, and enables staff to identify young people or adults who are maybe at risk of um, radicalisation um, through the prevent agenda. Members uh, should note as well every week we have a Tamworth Vulnerability Partnership meeting um, and that continues to be well represented and attended by um, partners, statutory organisations and on occasion voluntary organisations who may come across people um, with specific uh, more complex vulnerability needs. What I will say is that a vulnerability partnership is really for those who are where one agency is not just working with another agency can't I can't really resolve an issue so we can actually sit down as, as, as officers and representatives to understand what we can help and how we can help that person that's success um, also from the TVP recently we've we've identified with the police a way of actually identifying people within the TVP who are more complex and we can actually take them into a professionals meeting so we take them out of the term of vulnerability partnership and we actually do have specific meetings about them um, and that is also um, becoming quite um, well we, we are seeing an increase at the moment um, and happy to sort of try and get that through any further information that councillors may want um, so that the appendix is there for the referral overview and we're asking, as I say, just for members to consider and review the report and raise any questions. I'm happy to take those. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, anybody to start off? Councillor Jack? Yep, thank you. Uh, just a quick one. The, <clears throat> the graph at the end, um, referrals, I can't remember if it's the children or the adult one, I think it's the children one. It seems to spike in the year of the, sort of the start of the pandemic and it's reducing back down. 
it might not be linked to the pandemic at all, I don't know, but are we, the figure we're at now, it seems to be pre-pandemic level, are we back to a normal level, is there a reason why it's reducing, was it linked to the pandemic, because we can't see, we can only see one year pre-pandemic, so it's hard to tell whether it was always this low and we've gone back, or if there's some other reason. The, the, the pre-pandemic levels, obviously, we, we, we have, I'm just trying to work from, from, from the, the, the figures. So 21, 22, yeah, that's coming out of the pandemic. I think what happened was during the pandemic, there was a, a certain amount of closed doors. Uh, obviously, our staff were working from home as well, so didn't see people face to face in the same way that others have, have gone. So a lot of those would have been through that conversation during the time and I would suggest from that and I will check with Jackie because if you, you want to see previous years um, we can happily do that but yes I would suggest that what's happened is post pandemic and actually as people were coming out of the pandemic the referrals went up slightly as people were being seen again and it's now dropped back down to a level that it has been for the previous three years but I can certainly ask Jackie to supply any further information from that if you want to that's how happy to do that. No, I mean, I think that's kind of answered. It was more around what, because it was unclear what, how and why the pandemic would impact it, yeah. and it seemed to have, but you've, I think you've explained it. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? That, that was actually the question that, that, that I had. Um, I think another way to look at it, that, that with this being the halfway through the uh, portion of, of that graph, that we are actually, where, where is it? Yeah, so we've got the previous two years of pandemic. So, so we are sadly going to be on target to hit pre-pandemic levels on that, aren't we? I think, um, you know, knowing, knowing uh, from a community safety aspect, Yes, we, we have had, you know, for instance, domestic abuse at one time. It was during the pandemic, the levels of referrals into agencies increased substantially because people were at home, noticed things, heard things and they didn't see normally when they weren't working at home. Um, and that was more, not necessarily calls to the police, but more help and support from agencies. And, it, 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 and I think from the safeguarding side of things, yes, there were concerns that during the pandemic behind closed doors, people weren't reporting in things from a safeguarding point of view. And obviously officers hadn't seen or actually had face-to-face -face contact. So yeah, uh, things have increased, but hopefully gone back down. But you, we are on that target, the same level of, of calls. Yes, I would agree with you, Councillor Maycock, yeah. Um, ju just for me to just dig a little deeper on the training. Um, the safeguarding training with it level one, two, three, four, are they um, national mandatory things that, that that are set or has TBC said that everybody has to do level one, these people have to do level two, these people have to do level three? As, as part of our range, which with, this, with the safeguarding board, we have to um, identify roles that need that safeguarding training. Um, and obviously safeguarding is everybody's concern. So yes, the decision was from TBC through our um, people new to the organisation and review every year that because staff, officers and members have that contact usually with, with members of the public that we are and, and the staff are equipped to understand how they can assist. And I would say that we also um, encourage and give that training to our in-house contractors. Um, we do get safeguarding referrals from our repairs team for, for information um, when they come across people within their homes. So yeah, the decision has been for a long, long time with our recruiting that we do, all staff have level one. Um, and then the safeguarding board, um, through the, that, that training that's approved and is national, um, then ask us to identify specific posts that require further in-depth training for safeguarding. Uh, again, a little bit deeper. Um, the suicide prevention, is that just a bit tongue-in-cheek, but come if you want, sign on if you want, or, or is there a mandatory thing that says certain people have to do that training? We haven't made it mandatory, no. 
Um, we have identified teams and encouraged the staff to attend. Um, so it's not mandatory at the moment. It, it's, it's an encouragement for staff to attend. There are. It's a very difficult one to to, to make mandatory because people have. If they've had experience of or they are concerned about it, they need, you know, we would support them in that. But it, it's not mandatory, no. It has been, it has been delivered by choice. Anybody else? Councillor Smith. What's the most common type of modern slavery in Staffordshire? I need to find that out for you. I would imagine it's probably servitude. Um, but it, I don't know off, off the top of my head. I would have to refer to, 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 the, to the reporting for that. Uh, I'd just like to bring out a recommendation. I don't usually like doing this from, from the chair. I usually like you guys to do it. Um, but for the cabinets to consider if all public facing staff should complete suicide prevention training along with the level one training. Just got a, so another seconder for that all. Uh, Councillor Jai's seconded that. Uh, uh, open for debate. I'll, I'll start that off. So, so I've asked for that because although safeguarding is a very broad topic, the, the climate that we're going in and with, sadly, uh, suicides on the up, on the up uh, I think that people should be more aware about it. Uh, and I think that in a public-facing role, you should be aware of it. And for people to encounter that and, and then be given help uh, is a bit different to this is what you could come across. Please watch out for it and uh, keep your eye on it because it could save somebody's life. But also, if they're aware about it, it's, it's not going to come as much as a, of a surprise to them when, when they're encountering it. Uh, Councillor Jack. Yeah, I don't think there's um, you know, there's any negative that can come from recommending it, right? Um, there aren't always signs if someone wants to commit suicide, as we know, but there can't be any harm in people being trained to be able to pick them the obvious ones up. And like you say, if it says, if it says one person, then it's it's a it's a good thing, right? So I don't think there's any reason to not support the the motion. Anybody else? Uh, Councillor Smith. Yeah, sorry, I might miss this. Um, who's the? Who are the people who are looking at being trained? So, th the wording is public facing staff. So, so I suppose obviously that 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 recommendation will go to cabinet, and then that will have to be dug down a little bit deeper to see who exactly is public facing. Uh, I'm going to say all of we are. Uh, so. so in this recommendation, we'd all have to go through that sort of training. Uh, and the, I think this is staff, so just TBC staff. Yeah. Councillor Jeff. Yeah, I was going to say, I think when you first mentioned it, I, I imagine that the, the TBC staff, so, you know, where they're facing people that are coming in with queries and stuff like that, that kind of made more sense where I don't know over 30 councillors being trained on it was oh, it's a decision for later but it seems less relevant than the actual public facing staff in my view I, I think for me we're going to be coming across these, these people who are going through a tough time as well and we might see a lot more than TBC staff do. So I don't see why we shouldn't have to go through it as well. Councillor Summers. Thanks. Um, 
It's it's an interesting idea which I'm I'm inclined to support. My only concerns are that with the subject matter, you you, you have to be very careful. With, we're not talking about the the type of content you'll get on a level one um, kind of like safeguarding training. Is is quite light, for want of a better word. It, it gives you an introduction to that kind of area. But when we're talking about giving people mandatory suicide prevention training, it really depends on the content, I think. You have to be wary of of the individual you're forcing that upon's own mental health, I think, as well. Um, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't recognise, but it also may put them in a position where they think they're a little mate bit too qualified to deal with that person's concerns rather than refer it to somebody more appropriate. I, I think it would need a lot of consideration. I mean, I'm inclined to, I certainly, um, obviously you, you're going to put it toward to cabinet. That, that's, that's fine. We would, as you say, need to dig deeper, but I think that's my only concern about it. And I think if, if, if those that were interested in, in signing up to it and having it wanted to, uh, they're making that judgment call themselves, whether they can handle the type of content the course provides. I think you, you it may even, turn up that you need a different type of course for frontline people. Uh, I don't know the content of the course, but it just it just might concern me a little bit that we we can't just put that upon, you know, it, it, as it is now. I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm just, uh, that, and that was one of the reasons that we didn't make the, 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 the actual front-facing course um, sort of mandatory at the moment. Um, however, what I will say is that we do have an internal policy and process so that the staff, regardless of whether they've done the actual training through um, uh, that's, that's online, um, they do have and are asked to read the policy and the process so that for argument's sake, if a customer services member of staff has somebody on the phone who says, oh, I want to commit suicide, you, you know, um, they will have and do have that policy to hand regardless of whether they've been on the training or not um so you know all staff are made aware of the policy and all heads of service and managers um know that things can be referred to them and i'll give you an example of that where um the, the vulnerability officer on occasion has phoned back somebody or the manager has phoned back somebody and been able to actually bring that person down from that whatever threat that was or the policy says then please could you ask them to either um, to, to tell them that we are about to phone the police um, for a safe and well check and that that's how we actually approach that policy so whether they have the training or not they definitely have the policy does that make sense <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Yeah, I think for me, I can see it from sort of all sides, but I do agree with what Dan's saying, is that I'm not as so much training, I think it's an awareness that the policy's there, that's what I would go down the route of, because it's not, it's just saying that this is the policy, this is where it is, because it depends on what, because we, I would see the role of the frontline officer as more of a signposting or phoning up the safeguarding team, or it may be a case they have to phone the police there and then to come and do a safe and well check, and then that, that then that's sort of where it spirals out, and it maybe you don't do it, but you wouldn't often do it in the home, because you've got to look after your, because they've got to look after their own safeguarding as well. Um, so that's what I would see that role as, as more of an uh, aware. You could probably have it as an, uh, as an awareness rather than a training session. Councillor Jeff. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we're... I probably started it, but I think we're, we're kind of going into debating what is and isn't frontline, whereas the, the motion goes to the Cabinet, Cabinet decide if they want to pursue it or not, and it's then down to the officers and Cabinet to decide who is and isn't front frontline staff, so rather than us debate it, I think the motion's sound as it is, and then those decisions will come after, with my view. Um, could, if at all possible, just change or put a slash 
awareness, so prevention slash awareness training, and then that that broadens it out for for cabinet. I, I think you just need to resecond. Happy to resecond. <laughs> I'm going to read about yeah. it. No. no. Uh, anybody else, uh, Councillor Summers? Can I, can I just um, briefly uh, add that it, we've kind of um, perhaps identified that we need to recirculate all councillors' um, access points and guidance as to where you know who they can get advice off and who our safeguarding leads are, etc. So uh, I think we can do that as well as a result of the question. So, did you would you like me to make sure that? And I'm sure it is, but I will make sure that the suicide policy is actually on the member zone. Is that something that would be useful? I, I think it re really would in the useful documents yeah. section. I think I'm not sure where I'm not sure. I will check, yeah. but if it isn't, I'll make sure it's on there. Uh, do you go for the vote for the recommendation? All those in favour? Uh, unanimous. Oh yeah, uh, and also uh, uh, members to endorse uh, the report. Uh, I'll move that uh, seconder. Uh, Councillor Jacobs first. Sorry. <laughs> uh, all those in favour? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just like to thank you both for the presentation and uh, good evening. So uh, number seven is responses to reports of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. Uh, the committee's recommendations following the update on the housing strategy which were received at our July meeting went to Cabinet in August. And uh, I th I all that. It's so bloody, haven't they? Uh, so so the, the minutes are out there for, for Cabinet, uh, which I hope you've all read side to side. Um, I think I took, I took that. You did? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, Chair's move. Okay, so, so uh, basically what we're looking to get is quarterly reports uh, coming to this committee. Uh, and hopefully the first report for that will come in 20, January 2023, uh, which we can look at in the work plan a little bit later on. Number eight, consideration of matters referred to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee from Cabinet or the Council. At the Council meeting on the 19th of July 2022, a petition regarding the Castle Grounds toilets was received at the Council meeting. It was agreed that the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee would take on the issue, including in the petition specific to the Castle Grounds that the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee would conduct a wider review of the public toilet provision, uh, that recommendations be made to Cabinet at an appropriate time. Um, I think the Chair's view on this was to open up a working group. Uh, would anybody be interested in looking at this as a working group? 
uh, Pencil Woodrup. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Me? Yep. And I think the chair will probably jump on that as well. Uh, but for the interim, uh, there has the, the chair spoke to the assets officer, and it was said that the toilets are open seven days a week, nine till five. Uh, I've pushed back a little on that um, because at the time that it came through council and the recommendation for it to come to us, it wasn't then. So I just want to make sure that that if that is happening, it is ongoing. Uh, before we close that off, is there any views on the on the toilets or how to move forward with the working group? Anything they'd like them to look at specifically? Councillor Jack? I suppose um, it might be covered out way already, but in, within that working group, just <clears throat> while you've got those hours of um, where they're open, sometimes things happen in those hours and the, the toilets are closed for whatever reason. Just perhaps looking at the turnaround SLA to get them back open again, because it's all well and good saying they're open nine to five if there's suddenly one of them, you know, they're closed, then they're not nine to five either. So it's just probably looking at that turnaround SLA to get them back open again if there's something wrong. It's just an idea. Yeah. Anybody else? Councillor Smith? Yeah, this um, this was about wider the wider provision of toilets, wasn't it, in Tamworth? It wasn't just what we've already got. I, I think it was initially about the the castle grounds toilets, um, but it can be open to the more wider provision where the toilets are, if they're um, communicated correctly. Um, because nobody likes getting caught out in the middle of town. Uh, anybody else? Uh, item number nine, update on health-related matters considered by Staffordshire County Council. Uh, so there was two written updates which were attached to the, um, the agenda. Uh, but for a brief overview, I'd just like to invite uh, Councillor Jay to report back on some of the meetings, if possible, please. Sure, no problem. Um, it'd be quite brief. I mean, the, the main things that are, are coming through are not, not directly to do town with, but just more general, which we're seeing nationally, we're seeing in Staffordshire, we talked, touched on earlier, which is workforce as an issue. Um, so there's lots of updates coming on that. Um, there's been updates on SLAs of how many pe people that are waiting over X number of weeks uh, and bringing that down because there's a massive backlog. There's been a lot of work in Staffordshire to bring it back down. Um, it's still high, but it's, it's a lot better than it was. I think there was, I can't remember the exact number now, it was 44 weeks or 52 weeks. There was, there was some kind of SLA where they wanted to get that to be the maximum of people uh, weeks people are waiting for. Um, so they've achieved that. Um, and then it's all really updates on the integrated care boards and progress for that and integrating services, which we've, we've touched on some of that tonight, integrating services. So that's really the focus is workforce, bringing the SLAs down and integrated care. So whilst not specific to Tamworth, it is in a way because we all, you know, everyone's going to need care service, um, health and care services in some way. That's it really. Thank you, Councillor John. Uh, ju just, just to expand a bit on that, um, George Bryan sent that, although we're not speaking about it specifically in this this forum, this committee, uh, but me and the chair are still pushing through letters, further information, uh, which is then being presented to the county uh, committees. So ju just to make you uh, all aware that we're still still push it, pushing that through. Uh, Agenda item number 10 is the uh, forward plan. Uh, has anybody seen anything on the forward plan that they'd like to bring to this committee? Um, I, I've just got one that's on the forward plan. Um, that We're going to miss it for Cabinet this time around. But bringing the reset and recovery item back to ourselves. 
because I think the last time that we had that was January, the start of this year, and, and this committee does hold a work stream in that wider, wider work stream. Um, so I, th I think that's going up to cabinet in the on the eleventh of November, uh, but but sadly we don't have a uh, a meeting prior to that. Uh, agenda item eleven. So we've got the health and wellbeing scrutiny work plan. So we've got the update on uh, homelessness. Uh, so from the assistant director, neighbourhoods team, and Mustafa to attend. That's on the 29th of November. Um, I was thinking maybe one that we could add to that, which I think was about the same time last year, was the green and open spaces, because I think they were waiting on the tender went out for a document to look at the, the green and open spaces and the leisure facilities that we have in Tamworth. Uh, and I think it would just be important to uh, get the assistant director back to speak, t tell us how, how that's gone, the tendering process, and when a report should be out for that. Uh, anybody else? That might fill up that that 29th uh, um, attainment uh, and skills in Tamworth I'm going to send an invitation out to Councillor Kingston uh, later this week to see when we can get that booked in uh, especially with the college now going to be moved uh, we, we want to have that at the forefront of our minds because attainment's uh, a key for keeping the young educated. Uh, anybody else? Uh, so with uh, nothing else to add, I'd like to close the meeting at 19.29. Thank you all and uh, good evening.